God, I pray this morning that in our time together and as, as I open the word and as we seek to understand your word better, I pray, God, that you would be glorified, that Jesus would be exalted in all things, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would unite us as the body of Christ. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you may recognize this moment in American history, a great moment in our history when Martin Luther King declared a vision that he had for America, a day that one day all would be treated equally, all people of all colors, all races, America would be a place where black children and white children could go to school together and could be welcomed and celebrated. And he, he had this, this great vision. One of my greatest memories in, in my lifetime and one of the most unique opportunities I had was in um, 2009, I was living in Princeton, New Jersey, going to seminary, and I had a friend from Winfield who was living in Washington, D.C. And she had written to Senator Pat Roberts and had asked for tickets um, to attend uh, President Obama's inauguration. And Pat Roberts sent her six tickets to go to the inauguration. And so she contacted me and she said, I'm only inviting Kansas friends to the inauguration because uh, Senator Pat Roberts sent these to us, so it seems only fitting that Kansans should attend the inauguration with me. So would you like to come down uh, from Jersey and go to the inauguration? And I said, well, well yes, I would. I, I don't know that I will ever get to attend another presidential inauguration in my lifetime. And uh, I don't foresee that happening. Um, we shoved our way all the way to the back there of the reflecting pool. We just kept kind of moving forward and moving forward and moving forward. Uh, but when I look back on this moment in American history and I think about this happening, you know, along the mall, stretching so far back from where uh, MLK had, had given his I Have a Dream speech, and thinking back to this moment, I can think of no other moment in my life where I was with such a diverse group of people at the same time. There's been no other space or moment where I've looked around and seen people uh, so different from me, uh, all kinds of people from all different places and walks of life. And I, th I can't help but think um, how it will be one day when we all gather around the throne of Jesus and we sing together, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be gathered. And as cool as it was to have been at an inauguration with people from all kinds of walks of life, how amazing it will be to be in that holy place together with people from all over the world, people of all ages, people from different moments in history gathering to worship the King of Kings and to give honor to the right and the proper leader of all of the cosmos. And I think that's what Ephesians 2, this vision that Paul is inviting us to think about today, invites us to think about this vision of the kingdom to which we belong. Now, we all, you know, we all, by virtue of being human, seem to have this human tendency within us that divides us, right? We, we naturally find ourselves in competition with one another. It seems to be within human nature that we like to categorize people, pledge our allegiances to different sides. Sometimes it seems we even will fabricate difference. Uh, for the sake of finding where we belong. It's, it's easier sometimes to, to try to find what is it we have in common with another person uh, by looking on the outside. We say, oh, we walk in a room, we see someone with their Chiefs jersey on, their Raiders jersey on, and we immediately know which side we're headed to, right? It's just human nature, I think, for us to think about these 
ways that humans naturally separate ourselves out. And, and sometimes we do it in such a way and so quickly that actually we side or place ourselves with people who we're actually less aligned with because we've made a rash judgment based on something external rather than, than something internal or a, a deep value maybe that we share. A couple years ago, I moved from Southwestern College, where I had served for six years uh, running the Summit Youth Academy. You guys had some youth that came our way over the years. And um, I graduated from Southwestern. I um, proudly wear my purple and black. I am a builder through and through. And after six years at Southwestern, I got a phone call from a colleague of mine at Friends. And he said, would you ever consider coming to Friends University? Now, if you know anything about Southwestern's culture, um, there's one school in the KCAC that we really hate. As my dad has raised us to say, we'd rather be dead than red. So I got this call, and by the grace of God and through a whole series of events, it became very clear that God was calling me to leave Southwestern and to go to Friends University. And so when I went into my first class and I started to like, get to know the students a little and to find out this is my very first week three years ago, and I, I remember asking the students before I confessed to them where I had graduated, I said, now, of all the schools in the KCAC, who, who's your biggest rival? Who do you just hate? And they, you know, kind of looked around and cross-country students said, well, we just can't stand St. Mary. They are so good. I said, oh, St. Mary. Hmm. And another student said, well, you know, K-Dub's football team, we just, if we can beat K-Dub in football, we, we are just really winning. So they start to name all these schools, and guess what school they don't hate? It never comes up. They don't say Southwestern. No one even mentions Southwestern. So for decades, down here in Winfield, we'd been nursing this, like, rivalry, and all of a sudden, in this moment, I'm just completely disarmed. It was a disarming moment. And I said, well... I'm a Southwestern College grad, and they were like, oh, Southwestern, yeah. I hope, like me, that you have had a moment in your life that you can think of, either on a, a micro scale or maybe on a macro scale, where you went in thinking some divide was really strong or thinking that you had some difference with someone that was going to prevent you from being able to be in relationship with them. But like me, on a, either a micro scale or some sort of a macro scale, you had a revelation, a new vision for reality, a, a moment that was disarming for you. And you recognized, oh, maybe, maybe these are my people. Maybe we can live in unity with one another. Paul experienced this kind of disarming experience at a macro level. So he's on the road to Emmaus. You'll remember the story from Acts. Three times in Acts we read of Paul's transformation of Jesus showing up to him and asking him, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And from this moment forward, from the road to Damascus forward, we see where Paul's life is completely transformed. And in this transformation, God gives Paul a new vision for what it means to be human and what it means to belong to the family of God. I was just joking with with Isaac before the service that sometimes I make a PowerPoint and then I get to my classroom and the writing is so small no one can read it. So congratulations, I've done it again. 
So, so Paul is inviting us here. I know you've been in Ephesians for the last few weeks. And so here we come to chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. And here it is that Paul's starting to show us a portion of this vision of the revelation that he's experienced on the road to Damascus. And he wants us to know, uh, he wants us to understand this vision. So he starts by reminding us, he reminds the church in Ephesus and then all of the churches that would then read the letter as it would be circulated around to the, the churches, to the early church, and then today to us, he reminds the people that once you were a divided people, and it says, I, I found this interesting, I keep going back to this, In verse 11, remember at one time, you Gentiles by birth, you non-Jews, those of you who were not born Jewish, us, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision. So I find this fascinating as I've been studying this week to think, it's not God who said to the, the non-Jews, you're the uncircumcised outside of the covenant of God. Here Paul reminds us that those who had been circumcised, the Jews, are saying to the non-Jews, you are outside of God's covenant. Because we know, we know today that Israel had forgotten their mission. They were called to be a light unto all nations that all people would be welcomed into the covenant of God. And instead, they built a wall of hostility and created barriers between non-Jews and Jews. And so Paul reminds us that at the point that we had been outside, we had been declared outside of Judaism, and that there had been a barrier between Jews and non-Jews, that we were cut off from access to God. cut off by a literal wall around the temple that held God's presence where non-Jews were not allowed to enter into, into the temple where the very presence of God resided. So Paul says, you, in the Greek, y'all, right? In the Greek, they actually have a different word for you all, plural than we do here in English where we say you, it can be singular. So every time Paul speaks, he's speaking to all, all y'alls. He says, all y'alls, all of you, y'all, you were separated from Christ. By virtue of being non-Jewish, you had been excluded from citizenship in God's, in God's covenant. You were foreigners, aliens to the covenant, without hope and without God, hopeless to access the presence of God in your lives. So Paul's, Paul's saying, now I want to remind you, there was nothing you could do to break down that divide. But here's the, here's the vision. Jesus did for you and for me what we could not do on our own. So the scripture says, now Jesus brought you near. And Jesus destroyed the barrier. That which separated Jew from non-Jew, the wall that divided us, the hostility that existed between these two ethnic groups, Jesus came tore the wall down, and he took two groups of humans and made them one family. He took two groups of people, enemies, and made them friends. One family. And he did this as he preached peace throughout his ministry. Wow. good news. And so this is the vision Paul's wanting to give us. This is the vision for what it means for us to live and belong in the kingdom of God. 
Now that Jesus has done this great work, the vision he invites us into, the life that we've been called to, is that all people now have access to God the Father. We all have been made to share as fellow citizens. We all come to the throne of grace on equal footing. We all have been made members of God's household. And together we're joined together as the temple of the living God. We're as one family. We have made, been made the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Wow. This is good news. It's good news for the world. It's good news for us. Paul's vision, like Martin Luther King's vision, is actually God's vision. It's God's vision that all people, all nations, all tribes, all tongues, all ethnicities, all languages, all human divisions would come down and that we would be united and made one as those who worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Or maybe in our own lives it, it means that relationships that have been broken, that it would be God's will and God's desire that the walls of hostility would fall down. And that by the power of his Holy Spirit, a marriage that is struggling can be healed. That two people who are warring against one another by the work of the Holy Spirit might return to being one as God intended. That wildcats and jayhawks might worship God as one. That what unites us more than anything is the lordship of Jesus Christ and this recognition that apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot have access to God the Father. So wild cats and jayhawks, chiefs and raiders, sharks and jets, Montagues and Capulets, North Koreans and South Koreans, Ukrainians and Russians, Palestinians and Israelis, rich and poor, educated and uneducated, Protestants and Catholics. The vision that God has for us is that we all might worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as the cosmic ruler the one-time ruler of the kingdom of God. So I wonder about you this morning. Where in your own life is there a dividing wall of hostility and a typo, a diving wall of hostility? I give extra credit in my class when they find my typos. Where in your own life might there be a dividing wall of hostility? What barrier does God want to destroy in your own life that holds you back from recognizing the fullness of God's love for you and for other people? What prejudices might you be holding on to? What grudges might you be nursing? And how might peace and reconciliation change the way that you're living your life? continues to be that 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings in the United States of America is the most segregated hour in our country. And while 
the ethnic divide here that Paul speaks of is one of the pieces of the vision. There are other things that divide us today in our country. We're fiercely divided right now on politics. I, I don't have to name that to know that that's probably in your thought right now. And I wonder what if we as the church started taking seriously the ministry of reconciliation? Who might we be able to start seeing as a beloved child of God? Who might we begin to include and to invite in to God's kingdom to experience the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, in their lives, the same way we've witnessed the Holy Spirit working in our lives. I have a friend who um, told me in her church, they had had an African pastor appointed to their congregation in western Kansas. And when the pastor was appointed, uh, my friend told me that there were a few people in the church who said, well, I won't be back. I won't be back. I'm not interested in learning from uh, an African about the kingdom of God. And besides, she's kind of hard to understand. And I asked my friend, well, what does this person think that heaven will be like? Because if that's too much, heaven's going to be really overwhelming. But sadly, it's a reality that's still a part of the world that we live in today. And God has called us to be ambassadors of the good news, to recognize, apart from Jesus Christ, you and I would be separated. You and I would be separated from the love of God because it's the life of Jesus that was poured out that welcomed us into the covenant. And as the old hymn says, freely you have received it. Now freely go and give. Church, may we live more fully into the vision that God has for his kingdom by loving and welcoming all by the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen.